In this video, we combine some of the most terrifying cave diving disasters we've covered on this channel. If you enjoy these stories, make sure to leave a subscription for more exciting cave diving documentaries like these. Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula is one of the world's best-known vacation destinations. It is unfortunately also a place where tourists sometimes die in unexpected and shocking ways. One such tourist was Dmitry Chernoff. Chernoff visited the coastal city of Cancun in August of 2017, but to the dismay of his friends and family back home in Russia, Chernoff never returned. This is the terrifying and tragic story of how Dmitry Chernov met his demise while swimming inside a cenote, one of Mexico's most unusual and stunning natural features. Dmitry Chernov was 31 years old when he arrived in the state of Quintana Roo on Mexico's eastern coast. Chernov is something of a mysterious figure. Other than the fact that in August of 2019 he was 31 years of age, and the fact that he was a temporary resident of Quintana Roo at the time, not much has been made public. What brought him all the way to Mexico, some 10,000 plus kilometers away from his home country of Russia, is ultimately unknown. However, what may have drawn Chernov could have at least in part been a love of the outdoors. He chose to travel to an extremely beautiful location, famous for its beaches and tropical rainforests. Another very distinctive feature of the Yucatan Peninsula's topography is its assortment of cenotes. Cenotes are large underground chambers whose ceilings have collapsed, thus giving the appearance of a huge vertical cave. These vertical caves, almost like holes punched into the surface of the earth, are scattered throughout the Yucatan Peninsula. Some estimates put the number as high as 7,000 or more. In addition to being enormously wide, deep, and full of beautiful fauna, cenotes usually also have fresh water inside them, making them popular swimming destinations. This also makes them dangerous, especially for tourists and others not familiar with the area, such as Dmitry Chernov. On August 5th, 2019, Chernov and a friend traveled to a cenote in Quintana Roo called Luum Balam. Luum Balam was located inside a biopark where private tours were often conducted. The cenote is well known for having particularly crystal clear water, but this can be deceptive. The underwater space below the surface is nothing short of cavernous and connects to one of the largest underground cave systems in the world. It doesn't matter if you're Michael Phelps or David Blaine, you cannot swim fast enough or hold your breath long enough to even begin exploring the extent of what's below the surface. It is possible that Dmitry Chernov didn't realize this, or it's possible he simply made a fatal miscalculation. Either way, what happened on that day, August 5th, would cast a dark shadow over the biopark that would end up never truly going away. Around 3 p.m. that afternoon, Chernoff and his friend entered the cool, clear waters of the Le Umbalom Cenote. However, as investigators would later determine, Chernoff ended up unknowingly deviating from the approved swimming area within a matter of seconds. That's because a channel that was supposed to have been blocked off for safety reasons simply wasn't. There were two really good reasons why this area of the cenote was supposed to be closed off. The first was that it was dark. Sunlight naturally pours in from the main opening of the cenote, but only covers the areas directly below. You don't have to travel too far astray to find yourself in stark darkness, because after all, you are in fact dozens of feet underground. The second reason the area should have been closed off was that it went very far into this rapidly increasing darkness and very, very deep underwater. But if that wasn't dangerous enough, there was arguably a third reason why the area should have been blocked off, and that was to keep thrill-seeking swimmers away from one highly tempting feature of this particular cenote. This also happens to be the only factor that we can be reasonably sure Dmitry Chernoff was aware of prior to entering the cenote. Almost mythologically, visitors spoke of an air bell, meaning a chamber with breathable air deep inside this forbidden section of the cenote. 
Adventurers seeking to visit this rare, untraveled location deep beneath the Earth needed to swim a colossal distance of 50 meters underwater to reach it. On August 5th, 2019, Dmitry Chernov's plan was to attempt to reach this legendary air bell. The problem, in addition to this being illegal, was that it is an astronomically risky endeavor. To put it into perspective, reaching the air bell means holding your breath and swimming the length of an Olympic swimming pool. Only, instead of swimming across, you have to swim down. And instead of swimming in daylight, you're swimming in the dark. It is the aquatic equivalent of trying to leap from one skyscraper to another while wearing a blindfold. It is tantalizingly possible, in theory, but the potential for disaster is tough to overstate. Swelling with determination, and captivated by visions of what the underground chamber might be like to successfully discover, Chernov kept an eye on the rest of the people visiting the cenote as he took heavy, rhythmic breaths, filling his lungs with oxygen. Then, after one final breath, he slipped his head under the water and began to swim. The question of whether or not Chernov knew he was swimming in a restricted area, and to what extent he had to deliberately bypass safety measures, would later become a subject of legal debate in Mexico. It's clear that Chernov was trying to reach this fabled air bell and must have realized the risks involved, but it's also clear that the area wasn't properly blocked off. Meaning, not only that Chernov wasn't stopped from his pursuit, but that he also may well have been underinformed. As the sounds of sun-soaked activity were suddenly muted, Dmitry Chernov inverted his body underwater and began swimming the breaststroke, propelling himself as steadily and as quickly as he could. For the average, healthy, young adult to swim a distance of 50 meters while using the breaststroke, it might reasonably take about 60 seconds. Most adults can hold their breath for longer than that without passing out, but without training, it isn't necessarily easy. Especially if you're swimming hard and expending tons of extra energy. Another complicating factor in Chernov's case was the fact he was swimming in a downward direction. Thanks to gravity, this would actually help increase the distance he would cover per second. However, this would have the reverse effect on the way back up. And would be particularly problematic if Chernov decided to bail and turn around halfway. Chernov continued to swim down into the poorly lit underwater world. He tried like hell to keep his mind focused without letting the rapidly depleting oxygen in his lungs cause him to panic. What happened next is hauntingly uncertain. Some sources, including the National Speleological Society, report that Dmitry Chernov did in fact reach an air bell some 50 meters below the surface. Other sources, including an anonymous source who was present at the scene of Chernov's rescue operation, say that Chernov did not find any air bell, seemingly implying that there is no air bell to find, and the whole thing is just a dangerous legend. What all sources seem to agree on is that after reaching the 50 meter point where he believed the air bell was, Chernov did something startling. He continued to swim even deeper into the cenote. The reason for this is a mind-bending one. Chernov was so deep underwater and so far away from sunlight that he could not figure out which way was up and which way was down. Whether he managed to reach the air bell, recover his breath, and eventually dip back underwater, or he simply never got a chance to breathe again, Chernov made the wrong choice and swam a ways in the wrong direction before getting caught. Here, Alone, well over a hundred feet below the surface of the Luum Balam Cenote, he drowned. Attempts to recover the body of 31-year-old Dmitry Chernov proved difficult, to put it mildly. Rescue workers had to make several attempts, all trying to enter the underwater chamber the same way Chernov did, before realizing the only way to extract his body was by drilling holes in the bedrock. This would allow personnel to access Chernov's body from a different angle. However, it proved costly, time-consuming, and incredibly elaborate. First, a very precise and thorough survey had to be conducted in the low-visibility environment. Next, once workers had identified the exact spot where they needed to drill, bulldozers were called in to clear out a huge patch of the jungle. Once a pathway was cleared, no less than 20 truckloads of gravel were brought into the remote location to provide a road for the drilling rig to drive in on. Yes, they literally had to build a road in order to recover Dmitry Chernov. 
After flattening the rainforest, paving the road, and driving a 10-ton drilling rig to the area, it was only then that the real work could begin. Drilling a hole that was 36 inches wide, the massive drilling rig bore into the ground near the edge of the Umbalom Cenote. It eventually drilled an astonishing distance of 26 feet before piercing through and creating a makeshift tunnel through which Chernov could be extracted. Chernov's body was finally removed from the Lumbalam Cenote on August 11th, nearly a week after he drowned. The news of Chernov's tragic and horrifying death quickly cast a dark spell over the remainder of that summer in Mexico's tropical paradise. Chernov wasn't the only tourist to die in the Yucatan Peninsula that summer either. The Yucatan Times reported later that August that a total of nine tourists had died so far that season though Chernov's was the only death unequivocally due to unnatural causes. Local authorities also came under fire for the fact that Chernov was able to access this supposedly off-limits area of the cenote. Local publications, such as the periodical Noti Caribe, said that the biopark might be held liable for Chernov's death. Today, the Lumbalam biopark is permanently closed. Amid tragedy, legal woes, and the rest, the fundamental mystery appears to remain unsolved. Is there an air bell underneath the Lumbalam Cenote or not? Perhaps the risks of finding out are simply too great, and now that the park is closed, we may never know for sure. The Waianapanapa freshwater caves in Hawaii are among the most beautiful swimming spots in the world. You would never expect that they would also be the location of a chilling and tragic disaster. Countless annual visitors descend the rocks and float into the tropical waters here, but unfortunately, not all of them come out again. The two caves are located inside Waianapanapa State Park, which is located in Hana on the island of Maui. Hana is a small, rural town on the island's eastern tip, far away from most of the more tourist-heavy areas. However, the road to Hana is one of Maui's top attractions, largely because it is so removed from the crowds and so full of natural scenery. It winds and twirls along the coastline, showcasing waterfalls, old bridges, and other scenic landmarks as you venture further and further into rural Maui. Those who have the time to drive all the way to Hana find themselves in one of the most isolated areas in Hawaii, and therefore, one could argue in the world. The official population of Hana in 2020 was just over 1,500. The region does have a couple of schools and there are even a few small hotels, but in general, this is not a place full of amenities, and it's not a good place to be if you suddenly find yourself in danger and need help. There is no hospital or emergency room in Hana. There is a health clinic, but in the case of an emergency, all they're able to do is transport you from Hana back to the other side of the island where the hospitals are. The majority of the area is instead made up of beaches, gardens, and parks. The most notable of these, of course, is the Waianapanapa State Park, where the caves are located. In Hawaiian, the word Waianapanapa means glistening waters. This could refer to the ocean waves at the edge of the park, where the sand is jet black thanks to volcanic activity, but it could also refer to the park's freshwater caves. To get to the caves, visitors must follow a trail leading from the black sand beach that takes them along the coast and inland. The caves themselves are tucked inside dense jungle, and they have an almost mythical quality at first glance. On arrival, you'll see a yawning, angled hole in the earth, with vines hanging from the ceiling. Ethereal blue water rests calmly at the bottom, extending back until it disappears into darkness. Long before you reach this nerve-wracking point, you'll have to pass a large wooden sign along the trail that warns of the spooky legend behind these two caves. For generations, Hawaiian lore has told of a princess named Popoalia who fled to these very caves in order to escape the wrath of her evil husband, Chief Kakai. Along with her maid, Popoalia hid inside the cave entrance. Her maid sat behind her, fanning her with a feathery instrument called a kahili, this proved to be a fatal mistake. While no one could see the princess or her maid, Chief Kakai was able to spot the reflection of the kahili in the water of the cave. The princess was cornered. Having found his fleeing spouse, legend says that Chief Kakai was so enraged that he killed Princess Popoalia right there in the shadowy depths of the cave. 
The sign also warns that at certain times throughout the year, the waters in the caves turn red. This is said to be the blood of the long-lost princess. This myth likely has some basis in reality, because, as the sign also willingly admits, small red shrimp sometimes appear in the cave water, giving it a reddish appearance. The Victim There is something undeniably eerie about the Wayanapanapa Caves and they draw lots of brave visitors every year. One such visitor was Gregory Wilhelm. Gregory was a 33-year-old man from Novato, California, a small city just a few miles north of San Francisco. From the time he was a young boy growing up in the late 80s and early 90s, Gregory showed a clear passion for the outdoors. He participated in the Boy Scouts, ROTC, and a youth summer program called Camp Fire, after graduating from San Marin High School, Gregory continued to be a passionate outdoorsman. It was through the love of hiking, camping, and road trips that Gregory met and maintained most of his friendships. But why was Gregory so drawn to the Wayanapanapa Caves in particular? Interestingly, something unique about Gregory was that he appeared to have been a very innovative person. He was fascinated by environmental technology particularly solar power and electric vehicles, and he wanted to find a way to combat the negative environmental effects of waste. In 2006, Gregory started a company called Green Hauling, which still offers eco-friendly junk removal and recycling to the San Francisco Bay Area today. So we see that not only was Gregory a nature lover, but he was young, ambitious, and willing to take risks. He explored the rugged outdoors with friends in his free time, and he also started and ran his own eco-friendly businesses. It makes sense that he would be attracted to the idea of exploring these mysterious caves out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, but sadly, that attraction would turn out to have disastrous consequences. The Event In January 29, 2017 was a beautiful Sunday on the island of Maui. That afternoon, Gregory Wilhelm was in Hana, doing what he loves best, exploring nature with three of his friends from Maui. At some point, the group made their way into Wayanapanapa State Park, where they spent some time swimming. It's not clear whose idea it was to then venture into the jungle towards the caves, but we know that is in fact what the group did next. It's possible that the group had been planning to explore the caves ahead of time, as one might expect, but there is at least some evidence to suggest this wasn't the case. Gregory took his phone, turned the flashlight on, and sealed it inside a plastic Ziploc bag. Of course, if you need a flashlight inside a place that is both dark and full of water, that's a pretty clever solution. But it is also, by all appearances, a very spontaneous solution. This suggests that the idea came suddenly to the group, and that perhaps they ventured into these caves without really knowing what they were getting into. We also know that there was a definitive point at which the group split off from each other. There were four people in total, two women and two men. All four reportedly made the rocky descent into the pool of water at the mouth of the cave. Here, they presumably waded around the cool water and admired the scenery, like most visitors do, while keeping the daylight at the mouth of the cave in full view the entire time. However, Gregory and his other male friend eventually worked up the courage to try to swim deeper into the cave. The two women chose to wait by the entrance for them to return. Determined as always to explore the amazing natural wonder before him, Gregory took his phone which was inside a plastic bag and he and his friend began venturing off into the darkness. Whether the two men were aware of it or not, there were a number of odd discoveries and obstacles lying in wait for them. The first is that the water level in the Wayanapanapa Caves fluctuates a lot. This might be counterintuitive because it seems like a pool of fresh water would simply sit still and not go up or down. But the reality is that depending on the time of year you visit, the ceiling of the cave might be way above your head, or it might be so low that you have to duck underwater. The second problem is that because of where the caves are located and how they are positioned cartographically, Unless you enter the caves early in the day, you'll find the sunlight disappears almost instantly once you venture away from the mouth of the cave. The earliest Gregory and his friends could have been at the caves was the very late morning, and it's more likely they were entering the caves in the early afternoon, given what we know about everything that happened next. 
Another complicating factor is that once you swim into the darkness, there are actually multiple caves and pathways you can take. The largest of these contains a room where you'll find a rock formation that is known locally as the Princess Rock Seat. One would assume that, according to the legend, this is where the murder of Princess Papua supposedly took place. But there is also another, smaller passageway that winds further back and leads to another opening even deeper inside the earth. The rare souls who have made this harrowing exploration and returned to describe it say that the opening into this deeper room is so narrow that only one person can fit through it at a time. And if somehow that wasn't enough, some say that you can go even further than that. But amazingly, it doesn't appear that anyone, local, tourist, or expert, knows for sure. Likewise, we don't know exactly how far Gregory and his friend were able to venture before disaster struck, but we know it did. Somewhere deep inside the darkness of these mythical caves, Gregory and his friend got separated. This is strange. There's no current, and even though the water level fluctuates, the water should have been quite calm. Gregory was also supposedly the one with the light, so it wouldn't make much sense for his friend to have drifted off as he wouldn't have been able to see anything on his own. To the horror of the two women who are waiting by the mouth of the cave, it was only Gregory's friend and not Gregory who re-emerged from the shadows. The fact that he managed this without a flashlight is borderline miraculous, but we can be sure that he did not reunite with the women in a grateful mood. Rather, he would have been in a blind panic because he, and therefore nobody in the world at the time, knew where Gregory was. According to news reports, Gregory's friend then had to make a terrifying and incredibly brave decision. Even though he had somehow managed to make it out of the cave alive by himself, he must have realized that there was a very real chance that Gregory's life was hanging in the balance. And out in the ultra-remote jungle in Hana, there was no one else around who would be able to save him. Venturing once again by himself, Gregory's friend turned back around and swam into the treacherous darkness a second time. He hollered out as loud as he could, Gregory! Gregory! Gregory, where are you? But all he heard in response was the chilling silence of the cave. There's no question that Gregory's three friends would have been seriously worried at this point, but what happened next appears to be what sent them all into complete panic mode. Somewhere deep inside the cave, Fumbling around in the darkness, Gregory's friends started to notice the faintest hint of light coming from the further side. As he swam desperately towards it, the light got brighter and brighter. Eventually, he came upon the source of light. It was the flashlight from a phone. Gregory! Gregory! Gregory's friend hollered his name as he swam towards the light. Right up until he reached it, grabbed the phone, and found Gregory nowhere in sight. The Aftermath this haunting discovery proved that Gregory was in serious mortal danger. Not wanting to waste another second, his friend turned right around and swam back, using Gregory's phone to light the way. His horror was surely matched by the two women when they saw him return with Gregory's phone and no Gregory. Racing to get a spot with cell service, the group immediately called the HANA Fire Department, who in turn immediately notified a rescue crew. The rescue crew had to fly by helicopter from Kaluhui in central Maui, which is more than 30 miles away as the crow flies. The fire crew from Hana arrived on the scene just 10 minutes after the call was placed, but ultimately they, like Gregory's poor friends, could only wait until the rescue team landed. The fire crew did, however, make a very important and very grim discovery. Using their brighter lights, they were able to peer deeper into the cave and, crucially, deeper under the surface of the water as well. This allowed them to see, way off in the distance and way down below, the submerged figure of Gregory Wilhelm. This tragic discovery was made shortly after 1 p.m. However, due to Hana's remote location and the technical difficulty of the rescue, it wasn't until after 5 p.m. that Gregory's lifeless body was finally retrieved. The rescue team had to fly back after arriving in Hana to pick up additional equipment. Gregory turned out to be roughly 75 feet away from the entrance to the cave, which, when we're talking about a low headroom, pitch black cave you have to swim through, is a pretty long way. Final thoughts. On the face of it, this story is an unmitigated tragedy. 
a bright young man was horrifically killed in front of his friends who were unable to save him. But it's also a bit of a mystery. The obvious case of death here is drowning, but what caused Gregory Wilhelm to drown is less obvious. He was clearly a confident swimmer. He was young and in good physical condition. He also had a light source and another swimmer alongside him. What could have happened inside an empty cave that made Gregory drop his phone, suddenly get separated from his friend, and be unable to stay afloat or find his way back to the entrance? On November 5th, 2022, two recreational divers were exploring an underwater cave system off the coast of Santa Barbara, California. Near the bottom, the divers made a gruesome discovery. It was a human body. They immediately called the police, and rescue crews from the mainland were in the water shortly after. But determining the identity of the deceased body and what events led them to their demise would prove to be a gradually unraveling mystery, one that would take investigators back a full two years prior to the discovery. One of the first things investigators had to reconcile was the unusual and remote location that the body was discovered in. Everyone in the world knows Southern California. We've all seen it a million times in the movies, especially its pristine coastline. But what even long-time residents tend to forget is that beyond its coast, Southern California has a whole archipelago of inhabited islands. There are eight in total. They cover an area of roughly 350 square miles in the Pacific Ocean, and about 4,600 people live on them mostly in the small city of Avalon on Santa Catalina Island near Los Angeles. The largest island is Santa Cruz Island at just under 100 square miles. Despite being the largest, however, a government census conducted in the year 2000 found that the total population of Santa Cruz Island was, wait for it, two, just two people. For comparison, that means that nearby Los Angeles has more than 400,000 times as many people per square mile as Santa Cruz Island. When they made their grim discovery, the pair of recreational divers had been exploring the waters along the coast of Santa Cruz Island, thereby, you could say, temporarily doubling the population. They found the body in the furthest recesses of Painted Cave, one of the largest and most colorful sea caves in the world. It extends a full quarter mile into the underbelly of the island. The ceiling is so high that fairly large boats are able to sail in to allow passengers to admire the colorful walls. However, traveling by boat is the only way you can reach Painted Cave. This makes it a remote point on an already somewhat remote and barely inhabited island. It might be fairly surprising to find even a living person out here, let alone an unidentified dead one. Who was this mysterious underwater victim, and how did they end up there of all places? Two years earlier, in November of 2020, a 31-year-old man from Ventura County, California had taken a 20-foot boat out to Painted Cave in order to go lobster diving. His name was Ryder Sturt. Sturt brought a diving companion along with him. In addition to diving for lobster, the pair were probably aiming to enjoy some underwater exploration and take some photos. Sturt was a fan of capturing underwater footage from his dives and sharing it with his friends on social media. He had posted underwater footage taken from another island near Santa Cruz Island as recently as late October of 2020. The post featured a starfish he found, and the caption made a joke about the starfish potentially spreading COVID. According to Sturt's diving partner, who ended up calling the authorities around 6.45 p.m. that day, Sturt never resurfaced and was nowhere to be found. An extensive search mission was launched. For weeks following Ryder Sturt's disappearance, the Santa Barbara County Sheriff's Office and the United States Coast Guard used trained divers, boats, and helicopters to try to locate the missing man but with no luck. Eventually, teams from Ventura and Los Angeles also joined. But even with the search area cordoned off by Coast Guard personnel and dozens looking high and low, there was no sign of him. The search was eventually called off. Friends and family held on to what hope they could, but from that day onward, Ryder Sturt was never seen or heard from again. Two years later, as news of the 2022 discovery of a body spread from Santa Cruz Island to mainland California, Authorities did wonder if it was possible that the body belonged to the long-missing Ryder Sturt. Presumably, they were unable to visually identify the body due to underwater decomposition. Investigators quickly moved to use a new automated technology called Rapid DNA. 
They hoped this could quickly identify whether or not the remains belonged to Ryder Sturt. In December of 2022, the Santa Barbara County Sheriff's Office announced they had confirmed the remains were indeed those of Ryder Sturt. His body had been located inside the cave off Santa Cruz Island eluding the Coast Guard and multiple sheriff's departments for over 23 months. Authorities do not suspect any foul play in the death of Ryder Sturt. However, exactly what caused his death remains unknown. As of December 20th, 2022, both the preliminary cause and the manner of his death were reported by Yahoo News to be, quote, undetermined. At the time of the creation of this video, the discovery is still quite recent. Therefore, we cannot say that the case is unsolved or that a cause of death won't be identified and made public in the coming months. It would also be improper to speculate from the outside about the likelihood of that either happening or not happening. However, it's safe to say that the case seems pretty mysterious. Had Sturt's body been wedged in a tight spot underwater, or had there been some kind of observable defect in the equipment he was using, Authorities would probably not have listed the cause of death as still undetermined a full month after the discovery. But it seems as though no smoking gun of this nature was uncovered. It's important to point out that being unable to determine the preliminary cause or manner of death means that, however likely it might seem, authorities aren't actually sure that Ryder Sturt drowned. It may have been something else that went wrong. Though what? nobody can say for sure. The story of Ryder Sturt and his mysterious death at Painted Cave on Santa Cruz Island is uniquely tragic because of how long it took for him to be discovered. Friends and family waited two long years of not knowing what happened to Ryder and being unable to find him, all to eventually receive the news they were most afraid to hear all along. On top of this, Ryder Sturt's loved ones still have to contend with the many unanswered questions that still surround his untimely death. What caused Sturt to dive below Santa Cruz Island's waters and never resurface? The off-coast isolation of the island and its extremely low population seem hauntingly emblematic of the distance any of us have from the true explanation. But it is out there, somewhere. In the end, one thing this story can tell us is that diving is dangerous, and it is also unpredictable. Even the most experienced divers in the world take on a certain amount of serious risk, even when diving in locations they've visited dozens of times before. Every once in a while, the unexpected suddenly strikes. It is both heartbreaking and frustrating to be unable to yet say what unexpected events transpired in the case of Ryder Sturt off the coast of Santa Cruz Island, he appears to have been an active and outgoing young man who was loved deeply by friends and family. Few caves on Earth are more interesting than Devil's Den in Williston, Florida. Numerous photographers and videographers have described it as the most beautiful cave in the world. But it isn't just the natural scenery that makes this cave both mysterious and intriguing. It's also the fact that multiple people have died there sometimes under fairly mysterious circumstances. Today, we'll take a look at the cave and what makes it so unique, and we'll take a look at some of the stories of those who never made it out to see daylight again. The best way to describe how mind-blowing this cave is is to see it in person, and why it earned itself the name Devil's Den is to revisit the experience of the early settlers from the 1800s who first stumbled upon it. To find the cave back then, you had to have been traversing the grassy, tree-covered expanse of northern Florida, about 25 miles southeast of what is now the city of Gainesville. Hidden among a crowd of water oak trees and cloaked in thick vines, it might be easy to miss if you didn't know it was there. But as you approach, it becomes unmistakable. There is a hole in the earth. Sometimes there will be steam billowing out of this hole too, which really adds a cinematic quality to it. If you were a fire and brimstone Bible-carrying settler from the 19th century, this would be more than enough to make you whip off your hat and say, golly, that hole goes straight to hell. But apparently, the settlers named this cave before they bothered to actually look inside of it. Once they peered over the edge of the hole, instead of seeing the orange glow of Satan's kingdom, they saw tranquil blue water, as clear and clean as a whistle. 
While they probably didn't know it at the time, they were actually looking at an underground river, a river that is so old it turned out to be full of prehistoric fossils, including saber-toothed tigers, mastodons, camels, and even human remains dating back more than 7,000 years. Sadly, early settlers in this area were not on an expedition from the Smithsonian Museum. They did figure out how to grow some watermelons around the cave and how to keep their cows under the shade of the surrounding oak trees, but that's about it. Some of the braver youngsters around town would periodically use it as a swimming hole, but they quit doing that pretty abruptly once the cave started being used by the locals as a dump, and they say people have no respect for nature. It wasn't really until the 1970s that any further attention got paid to this extraordinary underground wonder, which was now full of trash and generally regarded by the locals as being full of demons. In the 1970s, scuba diving suddenly became super popular. Scuba enthusiasts realized that this so-called hell hole was no hell hole at all, but a fantastic place to go scuba diving. Eventually, the property was purchased by a couple who renovated it and turned it into a site designated for recreational scuba diving and scuba training. There are several features that make this such an ideal spot for scuba diving. One is the water temperature. For reasons that I could not find explanations for, but which I presume must have something to do with Florida's climate and the secluded underground environment of the cave, the water in Devil's Den never changes temperature. It is always 72 degrees Fahrenheit or about 22 degrees Celsius. That's not far from the temperature of the ocean in Southern California in the middle of summer. Another feature is the remarkable shape of the cave. The entrance is small enough that you have to walk single file down one flight of stairs to get to the water. However, once you get there, you see that the cave is actually getting wider and wider the further down you go. This continues in a big way once you plunge underneath the surface of the water. Despite the relatively narrow entryway, if you swim all the way to the bottom some 50 plus feet below the surface, Devil's Den actually gets as wide as 200 feet across. This phenomenon is described as being an inverted mushroom, and it makes underwater exploration here uniquely fascinating. But surely the main reason why visitors travel from all over the world to explore the water in Devil's Den is for its beauty. The images speak for themselves. It's no wonder that Devil's Den is a popular destination, but it's more than that. As I mentioned earlier, there is a dark side to this cave. It didn't turn out to be a portal to hell in quite the way its early observers thought, but it has claimed multiple lives. The first reported fatalities at Devil's Den came in 1990, not long after the property was purchased and renovated to be a dedicated diving site. Only a few records exist today that describe the event, one of which was a newspaper article that was apparently never published. However, after some digging, I've been able to piece together a decent picture that is also pretty horrifying. We know that the event took place on Sunday, October 7, 1990. We also know that it involved three scuba divers. Strangely, only their initials are given, CP, KK, and CM. Because of this, we unfortunately don't know much of anything about who they were outside of being scuba diving enthusiasts. We do, however, get a couple strong clues that CP must have been the most experienced diver and the leader of the group. CP had reportedly been to the site for a dive once before, just two weeks earlier. CP was also rescue certified. This isn't as reassuring as it might sound, though. According to newspapers at the time, CP was only rescue certified for open water. He wasn't certified for caves or for caverns. In addition to having visited the site previously after being rescue certified, CP was also the only diver of the three who chose to bring an additional set of air tanks. When the group first arrived at the cave around noon that day, all three of them did a dive together. As far as we know, this dive went smoothly. Based on the timeline, it seems like it was probably a pretty long dive as well. Depending on how far down you dive, Scuba tanks may last well over an hour without running out of air. It's possible the group got close to reaching that timestamp. It would be understandable if they did, because there is much to see below the water in Devil's Den. The rock formations in this expansive pool seem virtually endless for a swimmer's eye view. 
Remember, the cave goes down 50 feet and gets as wide as 200 feet. For an underwater space full of different rock formations, that constitutes a lot of possible exploring. There are both wide underground caverns and exceedingly narrow passageways, which divers commonly call swim-throughs. These are often so tight that divers have to squeeze through one at a time. One can't help but think that in addition to lots of exploring, this also constitutes a lot of opportunities for groups to get widely separated from each other. It's not just lifeless rocks, either. The water in Devil's Den is also home to quite a few fish and even some turtles, who were probably very pleased when people stopped using the cave as a trash dump. All of this would have been on full display for the three divers. After enjoying a thorough exploration, all three successfully re-emerged from the water, took off their masks, and regrouped. Whoever they were, I can imagine there was much excitement and discussion about all that was just seen and experienced below. Based on the timeline, it looks like the group took a short break at this point. It would have been sometime between 1 and 2 p.m., so there's a good chance they had lunch then. Even without knowing their identities, one can easily imagine the familiar sight of three friends out in nature, doing what they love, enjoying a scenic lunch together as they get ready to head back into the cave. The serenity of the image is heartbreaking, given what was about to happen. At 2.15, CP, the experienced diver who had brought an additional set of air tanks, decided not only to return to the cave, but to go for another dive. The other two people in the group could not join CP, as they did not have any air tanks left. Once again, it's easy to imagine the scene. CP waves and says, I'll see you guys in a bit. CP's friends wave back and say, have fun straps on the mask, sinks below the water, and that's it. CP will never be seen alive again. Since their previous dive was fairly long, and since scuba dives generally take at least a half hour or so, it was probably a good while before the other two, KK and CM, got really worried. But we can be certain they did. At some point, after CP never resurfaced, they called 911. Tragically, because there were no air tanks left, CC and KK were unable to try and look for their friend themselves. Things were looking really grim by the time rescue crews arrived. There was still no sign of CP. Searching an underwater world such as the one found in Devil's Den is an unusual and artist process. The search may have easily lasted for hours, especially considering where it was that CP was eventually found. CP was at the very, very bottom of the pool. In fact, CP had made contact with the slit on the floor of the cave. The prevailing theory appears to have been that this obscured CP's vision, causing CP to get turned around and end up stuck in something called a bedding plane passage. In layperson's term, this is essentially two large walls that are very close together. According to reports from the time, the bedding plane passage CP was found in was only two feet high, all the more narrow when you're wearing scuba gear. Chillingly, the rescue crew found what were described as clawing marks in the bedding plane passage where CP was found. It's frustrating that there isn't more information on this case. It would be nice to know the names of the people involved, as that would allow us to know more about their backstory and more about what may have happened following this tragic incident. What we do know is that this marked a dark and decisive shift in the attitude surrounding this fabled scuba site which at that time was still quite new to public awareness. Today, there is a warning sign inside Devil's Den that is almost shocking in how direct it is. It advises divers from swimming any further and features a picture of the Grim Reaper, scythe in hand. The sign describes how more than 300 divers have died in caves just like this one. It also warns that it can happen to you. Lastly, it says, with spine-tingling intensity, that there is nothing in this cave worth dying for. How true that is. As incredible a place as Devil's Den is, and as worth visiting as countless people every year find it to be, it is not at all worth it to take any kind of risk here or push anywhere beyond one's qualifications. It is absolutely horrific that it should be the place where someone's life unexpectedly and abruptly comes to an end, because, as was surely the case with KK, CM, and CP. It starts out as being a place of wonder and memorable experience among friends. Then, out of nowhere, one of those friends is simply gone forever.
We may never know exactly what happened with CP, but we can take note of the story and keep in mind the dangers of exploring such alien environments as these. We're all blessed to live in a world where such extraordinary places can be seen and felt firsthand, but safety always has to come first. In the middle of sweet, idyllic Ginny Springs is a gateway to hell, leading to an expansive underwater cave system that even the most experienced divers struggle with. The gateway, located in the middle of an unassuming crystal blue pond, leads to an entire system of underground caves that can span miles. They are the ultimate source of attention for divers. The Ginny Springs cave system is the dream location for many of the most experienced scuba divers in the world. Everything about diving in this area looks staged. The water is too clear to be real. As some divers have called it, there's visibility forever. At least as long as there is light. The hole is the perfect place for experienced scuba and cave divers to test their abilities. It's no surprise then that divers go to do exactly that and ultimately get overwhelmed. On June 14, 2008, 20 year old student Shannon Lewis went cave diving at Ginny Springs with two friends, both of them also divers. While diving, Shannon experienced difficulties with her equilibrium underwater. This meant that she was not able to ascend and descend at a constant rate. This rate controls how nitrogen from the pressure tank is absorbed into the body's organs and bloodstream. If these rates change, your blood can be filled with excessive nitrogen, which is what unfortunately happened to Shannon. Realizing she couldn't go any deeper, Shannon's friends brought her to the front of the cave, shallower water at only 20 feet deep so she could fix the issue with her suit. While she was working on her suit, her friends dove deeper and deeper. What happened in the minutes following is unknown. All we know for sure is that shortly after her friends left, Shannon was found unresponsive by two passing divers. They could see her face through her mask, a pair of lifeless eyes staring back at them. They pulled her out of the water and took her mask off. Shannon's lips were blue and she wasn't breathing. She was taken by ambulance to the nearest hospital where she fought for her life but ultimately lost. Now, if that was the only incident to come out of Ginny Springs, we could have an untimely death due to malfunctioning scuba equipment, or perhaps she was simply in a bit over her head. On March 10th of the same year, a 36-year-old Swiss man, Mark Fivey, decided to visit Ginny Springs to test out an experimental rebreather. He had done the dive just the previous year where he had found a new lead through the cave system. Mark had been diving since 1993 and a diving instructor since 2000. In those 15 years, Mark had successfully completed nearly 1,000 dives. He was, quite frankly, one of the most experienced divers in the world. He had traveled the world to fulfill his passion and had done it. Mark was an extremely smart and calculated diver. He meticulously planned every expedition, leaving nothing to chance. Mark went for a solo dive at noon. Though he was configured with a rebreather that could last up to 10 hours, when he had not returned by 9 p.m., another diver named Corey Mearns went looking for him. Following Mark's path, Corey found Mark unconscious 3,800 feet deep into the cave. Corey came out of the cave alone and alerted authorities as soon as he reached land. Mark's body could not be recovered until the following day due to darkness and safety concerns for the recovery crew. Mark's death was quickly dismissed as a drowning because he did not follow one of the cardinal rules of diving, always bring a buddy. Ginny Springs, naturally, assumes that as long as all divers are paired with a buddy, nothing bad can happen to them. While we know that not to be true because of Shannon Lewis, we also know that Mark Fivey was more than skilled enough to handle any such dive on his own. Mark had already concluded that there was no suitable partner for the dives he wanted to do, and as such, had grown accustomed to diving alone. The fact of the matter is, anything could have happened to Mark down there. His rebreather could have malfunctioned, he could have been caught between two surfaces, or even just wasn't paying as much attention as he should have been. One diver covered today was young, inexperienced, and had trouble with her suit. The other was a world-renowned diver and instructor who was one of the best divers in the business. They died at Ginny Springs only a few months apart. 
Their stories are different, yet no matter how you look at it, that commonality remains. Since Shannon and Mark's untimely deaths, 26 other divers have passed away at Ginny Springs. It's a harbinger of death, a siren song for divers around the world. It cannot be ignored, and all that can be hoped for is that divers take the utmost precautions while there. It could save their life. Sometimes even the rescuers need to be rescued, and other times, average cavers become extraordinary and step up to save their fellow cavers' lives. Prue Newton used to be a cave rescue diver in Australia until one horrifying experience changed her life forever. Andrew White was just an average caver who wanted to film his cave dive until the cave nearly consumed him. One became an archaeologist to protect caves and the pieces of history held within them, and the other used a camera to protect carts by showing audiences the mysterious and delicate world of caving. These are the stories of Prue Newton and Andrew White. Caving Down Under Both heroes of today's video hail from Australia. Australia has a rich caving scene with over a hundred individual caves ranging from huge caverns to cramped spaces along with many world-famous underwater caves including Cocklebitty Cave, which used to be the longest underwater cave in the world, with huge sumps across its 3.7 mile length. Amazing caving stories keep popping up out of Australia, including one from earlier in 2022, courtesy of Australia's premier caving team known as the Southern Tasmanian Caverniers. The STC was founded in 1996 when the Southern Caving Society, the Tasmanian Cave and Karst Research Group, and Australia's first caving group, the Tasmanian Caverneering Club, all merged together. As the name suggests, the cavers focus their activities around the Tasmania region of Australia. Tasmania is the large island south of Australia's mainland. The caves in the Tasmania region are mostly swallets or sinkholes where rivers and other bodies of water diverge into the ground below. That means almost all of these caves have water elements, making them more challenging to traverse and even more deadly. Tasmania is also colder than other parts of Australia, which makes the deep crevices of the region's caves even more unforgiving. The southern Tasmanian caverniers wear special thermal underwear to create another layer of protection against temperatures which can be just barely above freezing. The group has their own journal, and they also undergo research missions. On July 31st, 2022, the Southern Tasmanian Caverniers made a new groundbreaking discovery while they were researching the niggly, growling Swalit cave system. This system is part of a wider group of caves known as the Juni Florentine area in Mountfield National Park, which is home to six of Australia's deepest caves. Earlier in the year, the Caverniers realized they discovered a brand new cave they called the Delta Variant. The cave and its sections were all named after the recent pandemic. The STC then spent over six months attaching ropes and anchors to the new portions of the main cave. Each trip into the cave took a toll on the cavers. The entrance to Delta Variant was very long and very cramped, and once they got past this portion they had to work suspended over a black unknown abyss as they slowly set ropes and anchors in their new cave in preparation to complete a full exploration. The day of the full journey came, and above ground snow was melting into the cave, making rock faces slippery and frigid cold. The cave enters into a tight crawling section that terminates into a long vertical shaft with a sloped floor and a small junction into an even longer drop off dubbed Daily Cases that extends 534 feet down. The next portion is yet another extremely tight crawl that ends in one more vertical climb. At the bottom of this last vertical portion, they discovered Delta Variant connected to the wider Niggly Cave system. This new entrance was over 13 feet above the previous tallest entry point to the cave. That means the team extended the total height of the cave, breaking its own record to remain the deepest cave in Australia, stretching 1,312 feet into Earth's crust. This was an exciting story from the largest caving team in Australia. However, Australia's caves aren't always so uplifting. Prue Newton, Saving People and Caves Prue Newton grew up in Australia where she gained a love of history. 
She majored in history and archaeology, and she learned how to scuba dive. In 2011, she was working with crews during a sailing race when the weather started to turn. One of the yachts fractured their keel and capsized. The raging waters swept unsuspecting passengers into the turbulent waters while some people were still getting some shut-eye below deck. Much of the crew were without life support and totally unprepared for the sudden life-or-death situation confronting them. Hours started to tick by as the temperatures dropped to hypothermia levels as the currents continued to swell. With quick thinking and good coordination, Newton and the Coast Guard rescued the whole crew alive. That was the moment when she knew she wanted to be a rescue diver. Her adventurous spirit took her to Ireland where she worked as a diver. And while she was there, she learned how to be a confined space rescue diver, getting her specialty in wreck diving. Her career progressed, diving deep into the claustrophobic expanses of underwater caves, saving lives and exploring shipwrecks, until one fateful day. She was tasked with saving two divers lost in a relatively long, submerged cave. Guiding lines were laid out and time was slipping away. She suited up and took the plunge. Within the confines of the cave, any wrong move could be disastrous. She was over 300 feet into the rescue operation inside a 500-foot-long cave when her diving gear seized up. Newton frantically adjusted her gear looking for the problem. The struggle was draining her air as she started losing buoyancy and sinking. Maintaining buoyancy is critical for rescue missions. Her gear could weigh over 40 pounds, including additional oxygen tanks for the trapped cavers. If any of them needed to be guided out, their weight would put tremendous strain on her. And that's if she had good baseline control of her buoyancy. If she was already struggling to swim on her own, it could spell death for the other cavers. Plus, any additional strain would lower her oxygen even more. She could find herself in a scenario where she would have to let them go and swim away as they faded away behind her. Or they could panic and try to fight her, bring a violent end to one or all of them in this cave that was as calm as a coffin. By the time she corrected her gear malfunction, her oxygen was almost empty, but it was too late to turn back. She approached the two cavers she was tasked with saving. The first had already been taken by the cave, and the other was barely conscious. Confused by the lack of oxygen and harsh conditions in the deep black expanse of the underwater cave. It would take hours to call for another rescuer with functioning equipment into the cave, so Newton had a terrible choice. Risk her own life or sacrifice the trapped caver. The choice was clear. Newton started guiding the caver toward the rescue line. After a short while, she made what easily could have been her last call. She took out her respirator and handed it to the diver. She would try to haul the barely conscious caver out of the underwater cave while free diving, holding her breath the whole way out. She guided the trap diver across the guiding line across hundreds of feet through the cave while kicking and swimming as best she could after the battle with her gear. Newton started to slow down, and with the last line in sight, she hooked the diver onto that final stretch of rope. But shortly afterward, her vision started to turn black. As they swam the final stretches of the cave, Prue Newton passed out underwater as the air escaped her lungs and she inhaled the ocean. The light returned to her eyes as she gasped for breath and coughed up the water that filled her lungs. The team above ground had gone back under to pull her out. They were performing CPR, which saved her life, but it also broke her ribs and her sternum. She lay dazed and in searing pain. Each breath scraped her lungs against the shattered bones in her chest. Nearby, the trap diver had also made it out and was also being taken care of. Newton's dance with death made her reevaluate her life. In an interview with Fields Blog, she said the psychological impact of dying and being resuscitated was actually less than the guilt and trauma from deciding who lives and who dies during intense rescue missions. The experience made her switch gears to become a maritime archaeologist. Using her diving skills, 
She now aids in unearthing artifacts that have been swallowed up by lakes, rivers, and the ocean. Maritime archaeologists like Newton are also tasked with preserving underwater relics like shipwrecks, which are constantly being eroded by saltwater, microbes, other organisms, by shifting sea currents, and by geological activity. The work of maritime archaeologists like Newton has uncovered evidence of human ancestry in Australia that's over 60,000 years old. Many of these artifacts have been unearthed in both submerged and regular caves. Her story shows that archaeology is a strong second choice for cavers who love the thrill of exploration, but want to skip the dangers of mapping new, unexplored routes. A film director is born in Panican Plains Cave. Andrew White was one of the most famous cavers in the world. He got his start caving thanks to a school trip into the Biaduct Cave that was formed by an inactive volcano. White was an avid splunker in his off time, and he worked for an agricultural company to make ends meet. Camera technology started to improve in the late 80s, and that gave White an idea. Andrew White wanted to push his limits and film a cave dive in the Panican Plains Cave. Panican Plains Cave is located in the Null Arbor Plain of Australia's southwestern coast. This part of Australia is a massive expanse of flat land where there are almost no trees in any direction. This desolate, almost alien landscape bears the largest area of surface limestone on Earth, extending over 77,000 square miles. The Panican Plains system goes as deep as 2.2 miles beneath the Earth's surface, with over 90% of the caves submerged underwater. White wanted to push past the known limits of the cave to explore even further than ever before, and he wanted to do it while being filmed. The crew got physical exams to make sure they could withstand the stress of the journey, and they were warned that at least one person would likely die or suffer from decompression sickness that would send bubbles of nitrogen into their bloodstream, causing a blood clot and permanent injury. The team knew the risks, but they believed in White. The day of filming arrived, and White and his film crew descended into the cave. The first portion of the cave went smoothly, but White and his team only made it around a third of a mile into the cave when they started to realize something was wrong. This was well before the point where the cave was supposed to get dangerous, but below ground, they had no idea that just overhead on the final day of their mission, a storm kicked up on the surface. Winds started whipping across the barren Null Arbor Plains, reaching speeds of over 60 miles per hour, just barely under the threshold of a Category 1 hurricane. The dry plains get on average only one inch of rain per year, but this storm was unleashing over two times that amount in only 25 minutes. The exposed limestone surface above meant the water had no diversion, no rivers to fill. The thin layer of dry, above-ground dirt couldn't resist the flow of rainwater pooling on the plain's limestone surfaces. Nowhere to go, but straight down into the cave. As the rain began to surge into the cave, rocks and soil started flooding in as well. Two members of the team near the rear of the line were able to escape the cave just in time. The disaster gained momentum, and in moments, White and 12 other crew members were sealed into the cave as the entrance partially collapsed under huge amounts of rubble. You might think knowing that two of their members got out should be enough to calm their nerves. They would have a rescue crew out ASAP, and it would be a simple waiting game. But the storm's fury wasn't just impacting the cave's entrance. Small cracks, not usable as entrances for cavers, were still big enough to allow water to enter deeper portions of the cave. White stood above a cliff with fellow diver Vicky Bonwick as they watched the waters below. Panikin's miles of water started inching closer and closer to White and his crew as the cave started to flood. The water below them started to gain momentum as it surged into a raging river below ground. The force of the flood broke more rock along its path as it reshaped Panic and Plains Cave right before their eyes. The exit was still technically accessible. A rope swung violently from where the original entrance was, 
but rocks continued to tumble down the vertical shaft, making it almost certainly a death trap. Vicky lost all hope and sat staring off into space as deep roars shook the whole world around them. They were all there for White. They came to support him and to see his exploratory and artistic vision through to the end. Seeing hope drain from his friends and partners, White steadied himself and rallied them. White wasn't going to sit back and wait for the roof to collapse or the water to drown them. He was going to risk being crushed by the surging landslide at the cave's entrance and climb through the fallen rocks. Some of the crew either rejected the plan or lacked the skill required to pull off the daring feat, so they stayed behind. White and those who followed him latched onto the ropes and began making the dangerous ascent out of Panic and Plains Cave. They fought against the rain as it battered their eyes. They moved as fast as they could, slipping on the wet rock and sliding on the mud that covered them, weighing them down. Their gear was made for diving, not for these sorts of hybrid environments. But they battled past the threat of hypothermia. They avoided the rocks, and they climbed out of Panic and Plains Cave. Once on the surface, White contacted rescue crews. Without taking a break, he rallied himself and climbed back into Panic and Plains to lead the rescuers to the remaining cavers who stayed behind. The whole process took extra time because of the storm, and they had to re-navigate since portions of the cave were now blocked or rearranged from the cave-in. After 27 hours, the rest of White's team made it out safely. The crew let the cameras roll during portions of the harrowing ordeal, and although it wasn't the vision he originally had, White turned the footage into one of Splunking's most important films, Null Arbor Dreaming. This dramatic rescue story was also a turning point for White. He left agriculture and went on to become a journalist, screenwriter, and producer. He used cameras and his writing to tell stories of life and death, to shine lights into the dark abyss below the ocean and into the hearts of caves. And he showed how each of us has a responsibility to protect these pieces of underwater history. His works include the 2011 cave diving thriller Sanctum, and he also wrote documentaries as he explored underwater shipwrecks like the German battleship Bismarck that sank in World War II, and he explored the Titanic in the film Ghosts of the Abyss, where his team used drones to reach the wreckage of the worst maritime disaster in human history. Both Newton and White overcame death beneath the cold carts and icy waters. They later worked to protect caves and highlight humanity's close connection to these mysterious underground passages. If you're a splunker in Australia, you can check out the Austria Speleological Federation's Karst Conservation Fund, which provides financial support for even small-scale caving projects that help clean, protect, and restore the karsts and caves of Australia. Thanks for watching today's exhilarating life or death cave rescue stories. Have you ever visited Australia's caves? Let us know in the comments section and like the video if you've seen any of White's films. Don't forget to subscribe for more heart-pounding true stories coming soon.